instead of writing the low-level machine learning code, you're actually declaring from the scheme of the data actually what you want, mm -hmm. and then the details of how the model is assembled and the actual code path and process for training it and using it for prediction and uh, evaluating it, you don't need to, to write them, mm -hmm. right? So that's why it is, uh, I consider it to be a declarative system. Hello everyone, welcome to the Data Scientist Show. Today we have Piero Molino. Piero is a researcher turned founder and CEO. He was one of the founding members of Uber AI Labs. He worked on several deployed ML systems, including an NLP model for customer support and the Uber Eats recommender system with graph learning and collision detection. Later, he became a staff research scientist at Stanford University working on machine learning systems and algorithms in Professor Chris Ray's Hazy Group. He completed a PhD in question answering at the University of Bali, Italy. He is the author of Ludwig with uh, over uh, 8,900 stars on GitHub, an open source declarative deep learning framework. In 2021, he co-founded PrettyBase, a low-code declarative machine learning platform built on top of Ludwig. Today, we'll talk about his career journey project he worked on at Uber AI, uh, how he created Ludwig and built PrettyBase as a researcher in NLP. What are his hot takes on large language models and how will it reshape the industry and data scientists' day-to-day -day work? If you enjoy the show, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, and give me a five-star review. Welcome to the show, Piero. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Daliana. I really appreciate it you know, uh, being here, I think it's going to be a fun conversation. Yeah, I'm excited. So how did you get into machine learning? Yeah, so um, honestly, at the beginning, I was not, when I was studying computer science, I was not doing it. I didn't know what machine learning was to begin with, right? Actually, I was in it because I wanted to uh, learn to build video games. Mm. But then while I was studying, I discovered about, um, in particular, there was like this specific a coursework that I was doing on information retrieval and recommender systems. And so recommender systems were my way in into machine learning. Mm -hmm. I was really curious about how, you know, um, objects of any kind, in particular unstructured objects, like, you know, um, items with text descriptions, images, um, you know, would be recommended to people. And I discovered that, you know, machine learning was the way that that mm -hmm. was achieved. And then I dived deeper into machine learning and the language side of it, NLP. Uh, and that was like my, my way in, into, into the field, I would say. Oh, cool. And uh, later you got into Uber AI Labs. So how did you get hired? Oh, it was like, <laughs> it's a long and winding road, I would say. So um, after I graduated, actually, I moved to um, New York. And I started working in IBM Watson mm -hmm. uh, because my research when I was doing my PhD was on open domain question answering, as you mentioned. And so it was a really good fit in terms of topics, right? Um, and um, after that, I joined a small startup in New York that was called Geometric Intelligence, funded by a bunch of you know, uh, professors in the machine learning space. I think people may know, for instance, some of them like you know, Gary Marcus and Zubin Garamani, who is now like one of the most senior directors at Google on the AI side. Um, and that startup got acquired by Uber, and that's how we ended up there. And so mm -hmm. we, got, uh, we got acquired to become the core, the initial core of the Uber AI organization. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that. And uh, uh, you worked on a lot of projects while you were at Uber, so maybe we can start with this one. Uh, you use graph learning to recommend dishes on Uber Eats. Can you tell us a little bit of this project, what are the challenges and how did you tackle it? Yeah, first of all, there were like many people involved. There was not the only one involved mm -hmm. with the project in particular. I keep Jane uh, did a lot of work um, with me on that and you know all the people from the Uber Eats side, like Isaac Liu. Um, and um, yeah, so basically the way I got involved with it is that um, I was, you know, doing some research on the um, graph neural networks uh, because at the moment they were like a new shiny toy and I was trying to find uh, something interesting to do with those, right? Mm -hmm. um, I thought that they could be particularly useful for recommender systems because um, one of the inspiring papers was, you know, this paper on Pinsage, which was a system developed at Pinterest that was probably the first um, industrial system, like enterprise system that I know of 
that was using graph neural networks. And um, ours probably was the second, I would say, after that. Mm. And um, in their case, they were recommending pins to users. In our case, we thought that the problem was a little bit uh, more complex and probably more rich because it contained, um, it was not just a bipartite graph, it was like a graph containing users, dishes, but also restaurants, and yeah. also there could be other entities like cuisines and other uh, more abstract concepts, if you want. And so we adapted some of the ideas from PinSage, but we introduced new ones, because for instance, in PinSage, the graphs were um, really treated as, again, an un unlabeled bipartite graph, in our case, there were weights mm -hmm. on the edges and different types of entities also involved. So instead of doing like a graph you know, network, we're doing what is really like a um, um, multigraph, actually hypergraph um, neural network where the hypergraph had weights on the, on the edges. So it was something slightly new, but really interesting. And in the end, what uh, we discovered is that by using this kind of techniques, we could get like a substantial lift in the performance of the models offline mm -hmm. and also lift online. But the most interesting thing was the how, I would say, how the change in behavior of the users was reflected into the embedding space that mm -hmm. we were learning. And so we, were, we had like embeddings before and after some user interactions and you could clearly see the change in the semantic space mm -hmm. of the dishes that they like from one to another and as a consequence the issues that were recommended to them yeah well, that, that's interesting uh, i read an article saying sometimes the better your model is the faster the model is going to obsolete because the model changes users behavior and uh, it changes um, uh, the model's performance so in this case when user interact with the model differently how do you factor that feedback and retrain the model? Yeah, that's a very important point. And there's also some other learnings from that that are also relevant. I would say in terms of the retraining strategy, uh, we had an entire pipeline. We spent a lot of time like coming up, coming up with, a, with a pipeline that made it very easy to retrain on um, actually on, on a time base. Mm. It was like um, simple in the logic of the retraining, but was complex in what well, actually needed to be to happen for the retraining because yeah. we were dealing with large graphs there right mm. um, and so actually what we were doing is um, on a regular basis we were retraining using um, the new interactions that the users actually we're using all the interactions within a certain time window that the user has done and that would include the new interaction also because you want to make it so that um, the next time that the user uses mm. your 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 platform that includes the recommender system, they get new and fresher uh, suggestions. Right. But at the same time, in particular for the specific applications for reads, um, the use is still like it's it's unlikely that the user will use it more than once a day. Mm. And so for that reason, retraining for more than once a day was not right. that useful, right? Um, I don't remember exactly when, when we landed there, mm. but. Again, um, so just the training on certain cadence was the solution, more or less. Gotcha. And when you say time based uh, with this cadence, do you have a <clears throat> kind of moving window uh, selecting, say, like a moving 12 months or, say, three months data or uh, to retrain the model completely, or you just update a model with? the most recent information without uh, retraining the entire model. Yeah, so there were different components in the model really, and mm -hmm. the graph neural networks were a part of that component, mm -hmm. of, that, you know, of the whole larger system, right? And so um, graph neural networks have this nice capability of um, being able to learn in an inductive way, where if you have like a new node in a graph, you can just obtain the representation of that node by a form of aggregation over the representation of the nodes that you already have. Mm. And so you're leveraging the connections uh, to, to other nodes to be able to obtain these representations. Yeah. And so that part didn't need to be retrained that often mm -hmm. because of the fact that you know these capabilities, other parts of the model, like the final ranking um, algorithm was not as, um, I would say, didn't have these enough properties. Mm. And so that part needed to be retrained more often, I would say. Oh, got it. Uh, let's talk about the customer obsession ticket system. I like the name of the system, customer obsession. It's not just customer service. Uh, it reduced over 16% of time spent on handling the ticket without decreasing customer satisfaction. Uh, can you tell us more about this project? Sure, sure. 
Um, and by the way, the reason why it was called that way is yeah. that because there was a value in Uber, one of the like company values, it was customer obsession. Mm-hmm. It was actually probably mutuated from, from Amazon. Yeah. It also has that value, right? And, and so that percolated all the way to the answer <laughs> to this project. I was not the one making that decision, but you know, I think it's like, yeah. Um, so specifically on that project, basically it was a collaboration also in this case with many people, including in particular, uh, Washu Jiang from, from like the uh, then um, applied uh, machine learning team, uh, team at, at, um, at Uber mm-hmm. uh, and the you know, team that was working directly on customer support, right? Uh, there were a few interesting things there. So we tried the many different um, algorithms and approaches uh, to do that. And um, in particular, we started from like more traditional um, uh, statistical models uh, combined with feature extraction from text. Um, and they were performing okay. Uh, then we started using uh, neural networks. In particular, we compared many different architectures and we landed on, in that case, was uh, convolutional neural networks specifically because of a good compromise between performance and speed of training and speed of inference. And the interesting thing, though, is that in that project, it was not just you know, pure text classification. It was a combination of uh, text classification combined with additional features that we were collecting uh, based on the user behavior. Mm. So actually, some features were specifically for the users, independent of their behavior. Like, were they using the app from the driver app, from the um, uh, Eats app, or from the rider app? Mm-hmm. That made a difference, right? Yeah. Um, some additional information about you know their um, their past interactions with the platform, like how many times have they reached out to customer support before? How often do they do it? Have they reached out already in the last few days, for mm-hmm. instance, right? To figure out if it was a follow up or not. Yeah. Um, there was also additional information related to the actual interaction that they had with um, Uber at the time, which, for instance, if they were using um, the Rider app, that uh, meant that they basically, um, the um, ride information was also contained into, um, taken into account by the model to make their, its prediction, right? And that basically um, included like if the um, ride was canceled or not, how expensive it was, how long it was, um, all of that because obviously depending if the ride was cancelled, for instance, there was a really good indication that probably the issue was about that. Right? Yeah. Um, and so that made the problem rich and interesting and also um, made it so that there was actually the first uh, uh, version of Ludwig really was mm. the code base for solving these tasks. Really. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that we will chat a little bit more about Ludwig yeah. later, but um, the fact that there were like multiple types of um, features and mm-hmm. multiple types of data in general used for uh, for training these models um, made so that I made some decisions in Ludwig around it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so before we talk more about uh, Ludwig, um, I'm curious. So for this project, um, you probably have some metrics around measuring the machine learning model performance and then you also have business metrics to make sure um, customer satisfaction doesn't decrease Uh, so when you are creating this system when you are doing the test how do you balance the machine learning metrics versus those business metrics yeah so specifically actually to be precise about what the system was doing Mm -hmm. actually it was doing um, multiple tasks. Originally, we had separate models, and then with the use of Ludwig and uh, deep learning models, we actually trained a multi multi task model for doing all of them at mm-hmm. once. And one of the tasks was identifying what type of issue it was um, related to the ticket was related to um, from like a list of I don't remember exactly the number, but probably like six thousand different classes. Yeah, so it was like a pretty rich uh, kind of set of classes. Then, um, depending on that, also what was the action to be taken. Mm-hmm. Uh, like to give a, an appeasement or to like delete a user from the platform or to cancel a ride or whatever. There were like uh, several, um, I think about 100 different uh, types of issues, um, actions that the system could take. And then there was the um, uh, defining what template uh, among the different template for responding to the user, um, the customer support representative should use. And this is because the system was like a system for supporting the customer support representative. It was not intended to replace them, right? 
And um, with regards to evaluation, obviously each of these tasks has a different evaluation, really. And um, we were defining um, performance in these tasks in different ways, but in particular, the most important thing for us, which was really the bottom line, was how good were we at all these tasks at once on the same ticket. Mm. So the very bottom line evaluation criterion was how accurate we were uh, at getting all three tasks exactly correct. Um, at the same time, um, because of the fact that in the end, um, these um, uh, you know, models would produce uh, predictions that would be used by the customer support representatives, and these customer support representatives had UIs that contained basically three uh, entries. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided that um, figuring out if the correct prediction was within the first three of the ones suggested mm -hmm. was actually the most valuable thing, right? Yeah. And so that is was the offline metric that we were using, right? And um, usually you want to have like both online, more business-oriented metrics and offline metrics, because the offline metrics, you can evaluate them um, as, as you go and as many times as you want. It's inexpensive to run them, right. while the business metrics usually in require interacting with users, interacting with the real systems, mm -hmm. and so they are more expensive in general to collect, right? Yeah. And so, uh, once, and so we use the offline metrics to be sure that the model was doing something that was uh, correct mm -hmm. to begin with, and once we had enough conviction in that, then we analyzed the metrics from all, like live metrics from, from the actual system. What we did was a pretty straightforward like A-B test where we were testing either not using uh, the suggestions at all with, compared with using the suggestions coming from the model. And we were evaluating a bunch of things. Obviously, how long did it take for the customer support representatives to um, solve the ticket? Mm -hmm. Um, but also, um, when the ticket was solved, the uh, users would have like a way to express their um, appreciation or right. not, yeah. um, their satisfaction in general. And so, the you know one doesn't need you know. Let me put it this way: if one can be easily blinded by the fact that you know a metric like um, time of completion of a ticket mm. is reduced. But there's a really easy way to reduce the um, the time that it takes to, to to complete a ticket, which is just you know to close the ticket mm -hmm. without doing anything, right? Yeah. And that doesn't translate obviously in a great customer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. There would be like customer satisfaction would go substantially down if you know that's what the customer support is were doing, right? So we wanted to make sure that both things were improving, or at the very least that. If one was improving, the other one was not decreasing, right? Yeah. And so for us, it was really important to see that the customer satisfaction did not decrease, actually increased a little bit, mm. while at the same time reducing the time to solve the ticket for right? right. So it was very important to have both sides, because if you had only one, then, you know, there would not be like a good outcome for the company and for the users. Right. So you leveraged um, A-B tests to uh, make sure you're not hurting um, customer Experience. So I guess in this case, the primary metrics to measure is to reduce the time it takes that was initial motivation. And then the secondary metric, metric or like the guardrail is uh, customer satisfaction. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, so when you're looking at those metrics, are you uh, mostly looking at those aggregated metrics or do you also look at those specific examples when customers are really unsatisfied to understand the reason and trying to tie that back to uh, how the model works? We did both. Mm -hmm. Actually, the more, let's say, detailed analysis um, obviously have, is the one you can do offline mm -hmm. because you can have like retrain a model, you know, look at the, its prediction, uh, try to address them, uh, address the, you know, the, the most uh, clear failure cases yeah. and iterate more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, doing the sort of analysis on top of the business metric and when you actually run it um, is, I mean, you can definitely do it and you shouldn't be doing it, but it's then difficult to integrate that into the product or, or into the model mm -hmm. um, just because of a, you know speed of the cycle of iteration that you have there, right? Yeah. Um, but definitely we did both more offline than online, but we did this kind of analysis for both. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Um, is there anything kind of interesting or unexpected you learn from this process? There are some things that are unexpected that I'm not for sure that I can, oh, that I can okay. <laughs> disclose, unfortunately. Yeah. There were a few things. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing that was um, particularly interesting in my mind was to um, analyze differently some types of tickets, if you want, um, because of the fact that some of them were substantially more important than mm -hmm. others. Um, a, a clear example is tickets that are related to safety. Yeah. So um, actually, one thing that we did on top of the model, so the model was producing like the predictions and the probabilities and these top three for all these different tasks that mm -hmm. we were doing. Yeah. Um, but there was like a um, system that we put in place that was just you know a very simple set of rules to decide what to do with these predictions. Mm -hmm. And if the um, probability uh, coming from the model was above a certain threshold for all the three tasks, and the type of ticket was not among the ones that were safety related or anything like dangerous, really, mm -hmm. uh, then we there was a chance to answer automatically yeah. to, the, to the user. Like, it, like maybe it was like, like an FAQ style question, mm -hmm. right? And so that was the kind of thing that we were answering automatically. Uh, if it was like a safety issue, then always a human was involved in mm -hmm. answering it. And if the probability from the model was above a certain threshold, we would give the suggestion to the users. Right. And if it was below a certain threshold, we would not give the suggestion to the users because we thought it was more noise for them than useful. Yeah. And so because of that, we spend a lot of time analyzing the issues specifically within the buckets of the most safety related ones mm. and the most you know, uh, security and safety related yeah. ones. Right? And we had different policies for them, mm -hmm. and we spent a lot of time looking at those because we wanted to make sure that those were not, you know, impacted by any um, potentially weird decisions from models. Right? Yeah. We did a lot of better analysis there to make sure that right. there were not errors there um, as much as possible. Right? Yeah, this is really interesting because not every ticket is the same, or different categories of the issues can be treated um, equally, and then this requires a lot of uh, domain knowledge and context regarding um, the safety and security. I think you probably also work with those team making those policies to understand it and then um, translate back to how you recommend people uh, using this this model. And so you, you worked at Uber AI Labs. Is it a uh, central AI team for Uber for? Yeah, now things may be slightly different. When mm -hmm. I was there, it was like a, a centralized team and we were both doing research mm -hmm. and collaborating with um, other teams, product teams and more production teams mm -hmm. to put the latest and greatest uh, you know, developments from research and apply them um, into machine learning tasks that were then useful for products. And those two that we discussed about were examples of like taking the latest and latest um, things from research and putting them into production, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Kota, for instance, there was the, to the best of my knowledge, the best, the, the first uh, machine learning uh, model deployed at Uber, there was actually a deep learning model. Yeah. That's right. Wow. And for graph neural networks, the same was mm -hmm. like the first graph neural network model yeah. used at Uber, right? Oh, very cool. And uh, how did those problems come to you? Is it because you think those um, like graph neural network or deep learning are important, then you're looking at some problem to solve or those say product team came to you that have those challenges and then you, you prioritize those problem and then you pick one to solve. So it was surely more of the second, more mm -hmm. like product teams coming out with yeah. what they um, want to achieve and what they need for mm -hmm. their part of the product they're working on. Yeah. And us trying to figure out what is the best technique from from you know from the literature and from our knowledge that would address that specific problem yeah and um, in particular because you know we were a team that was doing both research and applications we were particularly interested in applying these you know new algorithms mm -hmm. and, new, and new ideas yeah. to these, these problems but obviously there was only in service of making the best um, uh, you know the best solution possible right no yeah um, if, if the, in some cases, uh, simpler solutions um, are, you know, absolutely uh, perfect yeah. for the problems, mm -hmm. for some some constraints. Like if yeah. you're considering, um, 
anything that involves like extremely low latency maybe you know like the, the uh, a large deep learning model may not have been like the best solution right but because for instance in that case that was not an in- incredible concern like mm-hmm. we could have taken a few seconds to to run the predictions so, yeah you know there was uh, the best solution for that use case right mm-hmm. so we were also particularly interested in figuring out what was the best for that specific problem not the best just for the sake of using the latest research that yeah. was not the intent, right? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times when data scientists uh, started their career in industry, they feel uh, frustrated because there are a lot of constraints. They cannot always use the state of our model in their in the research. But I think it's important to remember our job is to solve a uh, business problem. Uh, and especially, I think you mentioned a great point, there's no need to over-engineer, over-complicate a solution. Um, and uh, when we do research, sometimes we'll spend months or years to improve just say 1% or 0.1% of the performance. But in the industry, um, we have more deadlines. So how do you decide when a solution is good enough to launch? Mm-hmm. Actually, I would say there's even an additional thing that was a lesson learned from the Uber Eats um, use case mm-hmm. where you can have even much larger um, gains offline, like the system that we were developing got something like 20% absolute AUC improvement, which was like a huge, right? Mm-hmm. And then you put them into production and the downstream uh, business metric yeah. may or may not have um, an improvement. In our case, it had an improvement, but yeah. it was like... I don't remember exactly, but it was between 3 and 5%, which was not the 20% mm-hmm. improvement that was uh, observed in offline, right? Yeah. Um, I think there's many considerations to be done there because um, really, in particular, for me, the lesson learned is that the UI is so important in determining mm. um, the effect of what you're doing that, um, you know, one needs to take into, that into consideration a lot. In the specifics of Uber Eats, right? Um, if you're familiar with the UI of the app, you know that there are some, like basically it's a vertical app that scrolls yeah. and w- there's different sections. And then within the sections, there's carousels that go horizontally. Mm-hmm. And so for us, for instance, uh, the carousel that we were working on was the carousel of the dishes and it was not the first one that was appearing. Mm-hmm. And so in some cases, um, it was not even like some, in some sessions, they were not even shown to the user, the right. user would not scroll all the way to that point right yeah so you may have made the best recommendations Mm -hmm. in the world but if the user does does not see them that's kind of pointless right right and so the point is um one needs to be aware of the things uh, to um, when they are evaluating Mm -hmm. how impactful a system could be on on the users and the um, other aspect is to define the success criteria in a way that is both aligned with the um, business and the bottom line, but at the same time realistic. Because in this case, for instance, we realized that probably the best way to evaluate it would be not considering all the sessions, but only the sessions where the actual predictions were shown to the user. Yeah. Right? Which is, you know, you want to have a, like a lift in general mm. for the business, which is great, but at the same time, if, if you have not, don't have a chance mm-hmm. to make the lift for the business, you should not be evaluated on, on the cases where you're not having a chance to that. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe to get back to your specifically your question, which was about when you know when a project is done, really, mm-hmm. um, you don't know, but at the same, you never know. So yeah. you, you need to draw a line of the wrong time. Yeah. But at the same time, there are some indications of mm-hmm. um, of progress, and you can clearly see on one hand, if you're given a deadline and that, that that's that you have to respect, mm-hmm. there, there's no way around it. On the other hand, you can also observe. Um, the progress that you're doing and in most cases in my experience all these projects get to a point of diminishing returns Mm -hmm. when tuning and improving and doing squeezing that last drop of performance from your models uh, starts to take longer and longer and longer Mm -hmm. and so then it's like a a logarithm so there's an elbow of the logarithm and you want to get to the point where you know you realize that the amount of effort that you're putting is not increasing the performance substantially, mm-hmm. that's probably a good time to actually cut. Right. Um, and uh, when you uh, work with stakeholders from in the beginning, scoping the project, coming out with some suggestions 
to in the end deploying it to the system. What does the entire um, cycle look like if you can break it down the small st steps of the projects? Um, again, in my experience, what I've been doing was not um, substantially different from what is considered to be like, uh, I would say, standard. Um, the whole process was like an iterative process mm -hmm. that started from um, understanding the problem in detail uh, as much as possible. And obviously, you know, there's part of the understanding that comes also after fact, but you need to start from somewhere. And so yeah. the first step of understanding the problem, um, which also comes with understanding the data at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, the data that is available for you um, uh, is like a huge um, the description of the different fields of the tables or whatever your data, how, however it is structured, uh, makes a lot of the uh, understanding of the problem too, right? Uh, it's not all of it because there's also procedures and how this data is generated that is very important. Mm -hmm. um, but understanding the data to begin with, it's a great starting point. And then um, defining features and things that you know believe are believed to be impactful for. Um, determining whatever it is that we're going to predict mm -hmm. in, in the machine learning project um, definitely is the next step. And then usually um, my approach is to like come up with some quick um, version, either in some case rule-based or like very, very lightweight models that make it possible for um, having like an end-to-end -end pipeline that then feeds back into whatever it needs to like uh, uh, produce the outputs to mm -hmm. very quickly. Yeah. And once that is set, then you can start to iterate and improve both your understanding of the problem, improving the features, improving the models, and all continuously mm -hmm. getting to a point of really good performance. Yeah. So quickly get a, get a baseline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, uh, I wonder whether you had those situations where you're not ready to launch a solution, but a stakeholder really want to launch it or uh, you feel the model is ready, but the stakeholder worry about some risks. So when, have you ever had those situations? So um, the first case, no. So pushing out a model earlier than, than it was, you know, than I felt it was ready, <laughs> and, and, and that has not happened. Yeah. Um, it, I, again, I can imagine that in other situations that may be the reality for some people, mm -hmm. but in my case, it was not the case. It was, you know, um, always the case of um, getting to a good enough state yeah. and then you know, figuring out um, the rollout mm -hmm. after that, right? Um, and regarding the um, uh, safeguards and, you know, um, having, you know, concerns about, you know, um, um, me feeling that something was ready and other people feeling that it was not ready, mm -hmm. um, I would say the biggest example of that was a situation where there was a misalignment in the way uh, the performances needed to be evaluated because uh, both from a, like a, a purely offline way and more for like a, a business um, uh, performance aspect um, and those were the cases where like it was the hardest for me mm. um, I think, and that taught me to try to get as much alignment as possible from the very, very, very beginning. Yeah. It's not that in that case we didn't have alignment, but you know, the alignment was not deep enough. So that mm -hmm. then when the models were put into, to test for real, then we discovered that there were like things that could have changed. Yeah. Um, in particular, there was not the best way to evaluate them after fact, mm -hmm. um, but that it was like, too late to make the change. Yeah. So, you know, like, at that point, people were already, you know, sold that it was the way to evaluate mm -hmm. them. Uh, and so spending more time on evaluation, understanding for real what's to be evaluated and how and precisely um, all the downstream uh, pieces and aspects that go from the model all the way to the way it is evaluated, that is very important. Um, I can give you a concrete example of that. Sure. And the, you know, the case of the carousel that I was mentioning mm -hmm. before, there was a, a model that we were not aware of at the very beginning mm. that was deciding which carousels were shown mm. above or, or below. Okay. And that model used some absolute values coming from the, uh, you know, model for the carousel to determine how, you know, convinced the, um, 
predictions in the car results were. Mm. And so if they were really convinced, then they would be pushed to the top of the uh, app. If they were not super convinced, they would be pushed to the down. down. Mm -hmm. But it was done on absolute values, meaning that the distribution of predictions from our model was different from the distribution of predictions from other models. They were not normalized. And so the, you know, our carousels end up being at the very bottom of the oh. list, independent of the quality. Yeah. It was just a matter of specifically normalization and numerical values. Right. And so, you know, we didn't know about that that, that model behaved mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. We discovered it only after fact, but it was too late to yeah. change it, um, to make it so that, you know, they would take into account what our model was, was mm -hmm. predicting to, right? Um, there were some things that were changed after the fact to you know make it so that our model actually was was used for real, but um, that was like a moment of friction, right? Yeah, yeah. And so um, I think this is probably happened to a lot of data scientists. Uh, I think it's important to know how this model will be used eventually. Um, especially taking consideration of the UX, UI of an app. Um, sometimes, like you mentioned, the feature you develop, nobody is using it. It doesn't matter how good it is, if people don't use it. Um, you know, they, you can evaluate and you can measure the business impact. Or sometimes people's attention is also limited on the app. When you show multiple carousels, there is also this competition. Right. Um, maybe there is some, uh, we call it cannibalization effect. Uh, if those are uh, something similar, um, just think about, for example, on Amazon detail page, there's like customer bought this, also bought that or like similar products. And sometimes to customer, those things looks similar and they don't know what to choose. And if you're working on one product, you need to think about where else do people look at on this uh, entire screen. Sometimes it's it's not that uh, trivial, but we need to have awareness of that. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, uh, stakeholder interest alignment. So do you have some practical tips on how to align with stakeholders in the beginning? For example, do you write down all the requirements or um, what are something data scientists can do? Yeah, 100%. I think mm -hmm. You should always start from like um, a PRD, like uh, uh, at the very least a product, if not an engineering, but a product yeah. document that uh, outlines what you're doing, how it's gonna be used, how mm -hmm. it's gonna be evaluated, how it's gonna be, you know, um, in the end put into the hands of whoever is gonna use it for real, um, and have that clarity first. Mm -hmm. Definitely start with a PRD on the percent. Yeah. Um, and uh, so now let's talk a little bit more about Ludwig. You mentioned mm -hmm. while you were working on this um, customer obsession ticket system, you noticed there's some text data or tabular data, different type of modality. Um, what were the uh, initial challenges there and what was the motivation for you to build Ludwig? Yeah, so um, I would say the motivation for, for building it was that um, that project happened over a course of a few months, mm -hmm. right? And so at the beginning, we only had access to the textual data. Mm -hmm. And then gradually, we got access to the additional data uh, about the users, about their trips, about their behavior, yeah. and all of that, right? And so I saw a pattern that we would get gradually more data. And so I thought, well, mm, instead of having to change my code base and retrain the models and all of that every single time that we got some additional piece of information, um, I should probably make something generic so that whenever there's a new piece of information that comes in, it takes me like a second to be able to uh, add, include the additional piece of information yeah. in the model, right? Mm. And then the same thing happened for the tasks. At the beginning, we were just um, predicting the type of issue, mm -hmm. and then the other tasks came in and so I thought, well, I should build something generic so that if there's a new task that comes in, it, may, uh, you know, it takes me like a second to be able to add a new one um, as opposed to like spending all the time to re-implement parts of the code right, mm -hmm. to, do it, to do it. And um, I would say the nice thing about approaching it that way meant that um, the system, instead of be being like a customer support system, became like a more general deep learning 
framework yeah. that at that moment in time could do anything with text and additional structured data. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, um, other people in the company started using it for other similar tasks that were like more, again, text plus tabular data, if you want. Uh, that I was not expecting. Mm-hmm. Not, not, not expecting, I mean, I was not involved with this product, so they just started, you know, taking mm-hmm. it and using it mm-hmm. on their own, right? I didn't design for it. It was not like, no one came to me and said, oh, you should build a system <laughs> for the rest of the company, yeah. uh, a platform for the rest of the company to use, mm-hmm. right? I just built something that was useful for me mm-hmm. uh, because I was lazy, because I didn't want to spend, reinvent the wheel every single time a new feature will right. come in or any new project will come my way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then other people used it, and it was like the, the, the beginning of it, right? And then we added also other features, like you know, the images and all sorts of other things to make it even more general and applicable across the board. Mm-hmm. But um, the inception of it was just to make something that will make my life easier, honestly. Yeah. Uh, and how did your coworkers discover this project? So at Uber, there was this thing that's like internal open source to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Uh, meaning that um, we were using, oh, I don't remember the name of the tool. Uh, it was, it's like if you, you, you can imagine that it was something like an internal GitHub. Gotcha. Where you would put your, your code mm-hmm. and everybody would put their code. So everybody else could have access to everybody else's code mm-hmm. um, internally. And so people discovered it there at the beginning. And then also um, other people like were product teams coming to us uh, as Uber AI. And so when they were speaking to, with me, I would say, well, I mean, you should use this because mm. this will make also your life substantially yeah. easier. And so sometimes I would handhold them uh, to use it. And, you know, one of the main things in Ludwig is that instead of writing the code, you just need to write the configuration, mm. right? And so I would handhold them and maybe provide them the first configuration to get started and they will go from there and, and start using it. Yeah. And for folks who uh never used Ludwig before um, maybe we can take that back can you explain yeah. to us what exactly is Ludwig when you say configuration what does it look like is it in python or something yeah yeah, yeah. so it's a python project mm-hmm. so it's um written in python uh, originally was on top of tensorflow now we ported it to pytorch now a couple of years ago now we yeah. put it to pytorch and basically, it's a mechanism for training, uh, for building, training, and evaluating, and then also deploying um, deep learning models um, with uh, PyTorch deep learning models that does not require you to write the level code. Mm-hmm. Um, what it requires you to write is a configuration file, which is basically a YAML file. It could also be like uh, JSON or any other structured format. It's not super important. It's YAML, but the important thing is that it contains a um, um, uh, really easy to um, define structure mm-hmm. that if you follow that structure, then it makes it very easy to build the model. And um, it's very easy to get started. So you can just specify what are your, the inputs and what are the outputs uh, from your data. So if you have a table with um, uh, 10 columns and eight of them are inputs and two of them are outputs, you have one entry in the configuration file for each of them. And you also specify the data type for each. And the data type could be, it's a category, it's a binary value, it's a number, it's a text field, or it's an image, or it's a piece of audio. Mm. Um, there's many other uh, data types supported. And, um, and so basically, by defining the schema of the data, you're also defining the actual machine learning model implicitly, mm-hmm. because a model is assembled for you to solve that task. Yeah. And this is how you get started with it. And then you can tune and modify all additional parameters that are like hidden by default, but you can like change or modify as you as mm-hmm. you need, right? For instance, you can change um, the architectures that are used for, for instance, encoding text, or you can decide like which encoder to use, what parameters if you want to use BERT, or if you want to use like um, an LSTM and how many layers, what the activation all the way down to like very green granular level. Mm-hmm. And there's more than 900 parameters of these. So, you know, you get like really detailed. Yeah. But also it, it includes uh, training parameters like batch size, learning rate, the optimizer, the upper parameter of the optimizer, um, pre-processing parameters, mm-hmm. because Ludwig takes uh, raw tabular data and uh, in a tabular format and does all the transformations that are needed to feed this data into a uh, deep learning model, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and you know, there's also advanced functionalities. Like you can really easily make it so that 
the same uh, training process runs on like distributed system, um, a distributed cluster uh, by using Ray, for instance, just you know a few lines of the configuration. Or if you want to do upper parameter optimization, there's also additional few lines of the configuration, and the parameters will be upper optimized mm -hmm. with respect to the ranges that you specify. So it makes um, instead of writing potentially thousands of tens of thousands of low-level machine learning PyTorch code, mm -hmm. you can just write you know uh, ten to twenty lines of a configuration file, and you get basically the same results, right? Yeah. Um, so basically, um, it's compared to AltML, you can tune more parameters for data scientists. You have more flexibility and visibility to. I would say with respect to AltML, so at the very beginning when Ludwig was released, um, some people actually called it an AltML. Yeah. Tool. I don't completely agree with mm -hmm. that. Uh, Ludwig also has an AltML package within it that I will talk about in a second. But yeah. if you want to compare. Um, Ludwig and AutoML, the main difference is that AutoML is kind of like um, um, a box where you give it the data set and it spits out a um, model. Yeah. And um, you don't have a lot of levers and you don't have like, a lot of affordances. You cannot change the process. It's actually designed to abstract away the process of figuring out yeah. what the model is from you. Mm -hmm. And that's its value, right? Right. In the case of Ludwig, um, you can start very easily. And you, but you get okay. models that are you know basically defaults, and you can change everything to mm -hmm. get to the level of uh, performance that you care for. Mm -hmm. and so it's an iterative process where you, the data scientist, are the one making these uh, changes according to your understanding of the models of the data, mm -hmm. your knowledge of the domain, and all, all that is involved there, right? So you have the action ability, and uh, to get all the way to the single parameter, which also maps into like a Python code base, so you can also go there and change all, all a single line of code mm -hmm. if you want to. It's also extensible, meaning that you can create your own Python classes, um, give them names, and those names that can be referenced from the configuration. So if you're an expert user that knows how to build like a component of a PyTorch model, or how to write a loss, or how to you know do anything in the platform, you can build your own components there. So it's extensible it's a blast box that is extensible mm -hmm. and that you have a lot of levers to change and modify the process right yeah and i would say the last piece is that ludwig also has an auto ml um, uh, package within it which basically what it makes is gives you a bunch of uh, pre-canned configurations mm -hmm. for specific tasks that you care for and so it's a nice way usually to get started so that you have a data set and this AutoML package within Ludwig gives you a bunch of Ludwig configurations. Mm -hmm. You can train them and um, look at their performance and then maybe you pick the one that performs the best and you can keep iterating, modifying the parameters and improving it over time, right? Yeah. So the AutoML part is like one piece of the iterative process as opposed to be the entire compassing process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You also uh, wrote a paper about declarative machine learning. so. What is the relationship between Ludwig and declarative ML? Yeah, so Ludwig is a declarative ML mm -hmm. system um, because of the fact that, you know, instead of writing the low-level machine learning code, you're actually declaring from the schema of the data actually what you want, mm -hmm. and then the details of how the model is assembled and the actual code path and process for training it and using it for prediction and uh, evaluating it, you don't need to, do, to write them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it is uh, I consider it to be a declarative system, right? Yeah. And that paper, um, I wrote it together with Chris, um, uh, Chris Red, professor from Stanford, that I was working with um, at the time um, after I left Uber. Mm. And the reason for writing that paper is that he also created a similar system to Ludwig that is called Overton. Yeah. It was an internal system at Apple while he was working at Apple. Mm -hmm. And when we were chatting, we discovered that there was like I don't know, like a ninety percent overlap yeah. in in uh, in what I was building in, in, mm -hmm. in the open and what he was building yeah. um, at Apple. And there is also another system called Looper that is developed at Meta mm -hmm. that also follows the same principles, right. providing like a configuration system and makes it easy, making it easy for uh, data scientists and for developers to actually um, train and use machine learning models, right? And so we wanted to make it so that all these systems had like um, the similarities among these systems mm -hmm. were captured in like one um, one paper that describes 
a general uh, uh, their general functionality mm -hmm. and also what are like the advantages of all these systems because again they share all these uh, commonalities mm -hmm. and also what are the um, you know potential limitations and things to improve in the future and look forward to in the future right yeah um, it's, it's really cool that you open source uh, this Ludwig is something people use at Facebook or um, Apple now it's um, accessible for other people um, who doesn't have access to those closed um, system. And I have, I have friends working at uh, um, Facebook, they're joking with this internal um, declarative system, everybody is a config engineer. <laughs> of course, you have to understand what's going on behind the machine learning system. So uh, sometimes people working at large companies, they feel um, because their internal tooling is very strong and mature and all they work with is dealing with the configs they they're not like data scientists working at smaller companies they they can try different tools and learn you know what is the uh, most recent ml ops tools so sometimes they feel their skill set is a little bit um, obsolete so how do you uh what do you think about people using um say a config based tool versus build their own tools and explore multiple ML ops tools and then um, build their own system. I think there's pros and cons mm -hmm. and also it depends on the goals which yeah. that someone has, right? So if you think about it from a company perspective, um, obviously that makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. right? Because um, instead of um, having everybody you know build their own thing and reinventing the wheel every single time mm -hmm. they invent the wheel one time yeah and then they can reuse it all the time and the you know your friends capabilities of working with configurations mm -hmm. also it's great because it makes it possible for them to spend a lot more time on other things that are potentially more valuable like mm -hmm. actually looking at the data analyzing figuring out what are the errors that the model is making doing deep uh, analysis of that and then improving the models by also improving the data right? mm -hmm. so it's like a more um, human in the loop data centric kind of process mm -hmm. that is definitely more useful for achieving better performance than actually tinkering with the single parameter of the models and also you know going all the way down to implement things right yeah um, and with respect to um, the aspect of you know um, not getting um, like the skill set right mm -hmm. um, I think it, the same thing can be applied at different levels, right? Um, for instance, uh, when compilers are introduced, um, then people maybe don't need to, uh, not as many people need to know about low level assembly code. Yeah. Um, is it good or is it bad? Um, I think in terms of overall productivity, it's substantially better. Mm -hmm. There's now many more people can write, you know, higher level uh, kind of uh, code. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's still people who write low-level uh, assembly code for like very mission critical cases mm -hmm. where that makes particular sense, right? Yeah. But those are like niche cases, and the long tail is addressed mm -hmm. by higher level uh, languages. Yeah. I think it's the same thing is happening and can be happening um, for machine learning too. And so I think creating the separation of interest of the people who are developing the underneath systems and the people who are like that using these systems um, is healthy for the ecosystem mm -hmm. um, and honestly to make to make another con concrete example like the fact that there is a really robust implementation of um, I don't know gradient boosted machines there's actually more than one like yeah. there's several robust implementation of gradient boosted machines means that uh, how many people are re-implementing from scratch mm -hmm. gradient boosted machines very very few I would say probably the maintainers of XGBoost of, of um, uh, like GBM and and, and, and scikit-learn are mm -hmm. probably among the very few who are actually doing it. Right? Yeah. But then Excel, because then now how many people are using mm -hmm. then XGBoosts in their in their um, in their like modeling tasks? Yeah. Many many more people than the ones that would have been able to write a really efficient and, and good implementation. Mm -hmm. of it, right. Yeah. Um, and also, if you have a good foundation in you know machine learning in statistics, um, and you know how to code in Python, it's not hard to learn 
some other tools whenever you need to learn because there are a lot of tools out there. It's impossible to learn um, everything. Absolutely. Yeah. When you left Uber and joined uh, um, Chris, uh, Professor Chris Ray's lab, what was the motivation uh, to do that? Yeah, so we had in mind the idea of eventually starting a company together, mm. uh, but we needed some time to you know, figure out the uh, details. And yeah. also was it after out. Ludwig or before you created so, Ludwig? Uh, Ludwig was, I, when I actually started working on Ludwig was end of 2016, beginning of 2017. Mm -hmm. When it was open source, it was 2019. Okay. Um, I left Uber in 2020 mm -hmm. and joined uh, Chris, um, Chris uh, Lab in 2020. Mm -hmm. And then I started Predibase in 2021. Mm -hmm. So there was that gap here between yeah. Uber and the company. Mm -hmm. So we had the idea that we wanted to start a company, but we needed to, well, we wanted to work together on a few things, including this paper, for instance. It yeah. was one of the things that we uh, came out of that you know, mm -hmm. collaboration, I would say. And, um, uh, you know, we were testing out ideas of how to really bring this, um, this thing to the market, really. Because mm -hmm. we saw that it was working at Apple, at, at Meta, uh, Facebook at the time, um, at Uber in the open source. And so we thought that, you know, other organizations around the world would have been would be useful for also other organizations, yeah. but we need to figure out the details of it and to make it so that it's um, um, clear what we're going after with the company. Right? Yeah. And how did you meet Professor uh, Chris? There was, it's a fun story. So um, when I released um, Ludwig, I think a couple of months later, there was an event at Stanford uh, where it was a conversation between Chris and uh, Jeff Dean. Mm. And they were discussing about the uh, future of machine learning infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And um, that was recorded for some reason. And um, I don't remember whom, I think like a, a little contributor uh, sent the link to the recording to me. Mm -hmm. I watched it. And during that you know, conversation, uh, Chris said, oh, and there is this like new project from Uber called Ludwig that yeah. I think is very, very cool. And so I reached out to him. Uh, to say thank you, really, for the public <laughs> shout out, yeah. and invited me to give a talk at his lab at Stanford, mm -hmm. and I went there. It was supposed to be half an hour. It became two hours because we were yeah. jamming a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, he was asking me a lot of questions, mm -hmm. and you know, it was was a lot of really, really entertaining um, time and really entertaining conversation. And yeah, that, that's how we got to know each other, mm -hmm. and then you know that it spiraled out from there. And now we're working together. Oh, got it. So at that time, was it a difficult decision? Um, to quit Uber and join his lab? Yeah, so at the time Uber decided that um, really wanted to reorganize mm -hmm. the way that the ML organization, uh, uh, ML was done in the company, including the AI organization. Yeah. And there was not much space for this hybrid research and application mm -hmm. uh, that uh, yeah. I was really, that was the main reason why I was there because mm -hmm. I liked uh, both doing research and applications at the same time. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so it was not a hard decision to um, leave Uber at the time because of that reorganization. Yeah. Um, and it was not a hard decision to join Chris because <laughs> it was was great. Right. Uh, uh, we were already entertaining mm -hmm. uh, the idea of doing it. And um, so it was not a hard decision, but um, I think it was a little bit harder just because of the fact that it was in full steam pandemic. Mm. And so that was the, what made it a little bit more tricky than it yeah. could have been. But at the same time, you know, uh, there was nothing I could do about it. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I know you did a lot of research uh, about um, NLP, and then you were especially on uh, question answering. So I definitely want to get your thoughts on large language models. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, since we already talked about your your journey joining the lab, creating declarative ML, um, let's talk about. Um, what made you want to start uh, Predibase? Mm. Yeah, so again, as, as I mentioned, really the realization mm -hmm. that what I was already doing with Ludwig in the open source um, was a thing that could have been valuable mm -hmm. outside of the, you know, um, the larger organizations where that was used, but yeah. and also in, 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 um, in the rest of the industry. Mm -hmm. That was one of the main motivations. And also um, the fact that I was really, you know, um, interested in um, 
working to build a company. Mm -hmm. There was something that um, I just scratched the surface of previously in my career. And when I worked at the startup in dramatic intelligence, I had yeah. a really good time. I enjoyed it a lot. And so I wanted to try to replicate the same feeling of mm -hmm. camaraderie, working together, being um, really shoulder to shoulder with, uh, with co-workers. And um, that was you know, a lot of fun for me and mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. And so I wanted to do it again. Honestly. Yeah. These were the two main motivations for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Pretty Base is built on top of Ludwig. Yeah. And what's the difference between uh, Pretty Base and Ludwig? A good analogy there is that Ludwig is the engine while Pretty Base is the car, mm -hmm. meaning that we're building all sorts of components around the engine to make it so that um, organizations uh, and enterprises can use it in the cloud uh, very easily. And also adding additional features that someone who would have adopted it um, in their in their like as, as a piece of their mm. platform would have needed to be to build to make it useful. In yeah. particular, components around data connection, components around in, um, model um, experimentation, tracking, and iteration, mm -hmm. components about deployment of the models um, at you know really scalable, really scalable way. And um, components around uh, managing all the underlying infrastructure for both distributed training and distributed um, uh, in the cloud. Mm -hmm. right? So all these things are like um, parts of what we're building a credit base that makes using Bootpick substantially easier. And then we're also adding on top of it a bunch of, um, let's say, peculiar um, um, components that make it easy for people to use it, um, in particular, graphical user interface, um, Python SDK, so that it can be connected with all the entire Python ecosystem, mm -hmm. with Python code like in notebooks or in scripts or whatever. It is. Yeah. And and also, um, we have this new concept that we call PQL, which is an extension of SQL, where you have predictive predicates inside uh, SQL queries mm -hmm. that make it possible to do both you know, predictive analytics and do both you know, the kind of things that you do in, in SQL and analyzing, selecting, and slicing your data um, at the same time as predicting on, on, on the data that you are you know, manipulating. Mm -hmm. An example could be instead of writing a simple query for like selecting the customers that spent more than $100 last month in your platform, you can write a query that says select those customers and for those customers predict if they're going to churn next month or not. Yeah. Um, and uh, do you have some examples of how our customers are using um, Pretty Base? What are the use case? I don't know if you uh, could share some customer. Yeah, so I would say the interesting thing is that obviously because it's built on Ludwig, mm -hmm. it's really general. Yeah. The platform is really general. So it can be applied to many use cases. Mm -hmm. And the ones that we have seen being um, more used and particularly interesting and unique are the ones that um, are related with uh, multimodal data, mm -hmm. where you have, for instance, text and some metadata, or images and some metadata, or audio and some metadata. And um, other ones that are more, um, let's say, in terms of tasks, more recommender-oriented tasks, mm -hmm. where you also have additional information about, for instance, the items that you're suggesting. And those items include text, image, and, and um, audio features on top of the regular, uh, you know, more tabular and structured features. And some examples of this are, for instance, there's this company called um, uh, Paradigm that um, uh, what they do is they're, they're, they're a platform for trading on crypto. And um, basically, they're building an alerting system mm -hmm. using private base um, that alerts the user for new, um, new trades mm -hmm. that, are, that are possible in the platform. Um, and um, another company that we're working with um, is like a large US healthcare company, and they're using the platform for many use cases, which include use cases where you have both text and unstructured data, um, some, and also images and unstructured data from some medical um, aspects like uh, mammography, using mammography data, for mm -hmm. instance, and also for uh, detecting uh, potential issues with um, uh, people's respiration yeah. by analyzing the um, audio uh, of their communications mm. with, with the doctors, right? Yeah. So it's a wide range, honestly, of different applications that people mm. are using it for. Yeah. And uh, um, so who should use um, Pretty Base? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think there's two buckets. And um, I would say on one hand, there are like larger enterprises where there's like teams of data scientists that by using this platform can be supercharged and be like substantially faster at um, developing their machine learning projects. And for instance, with some of the organizations that we've been working with, teams that were putting a couple models in production in a year were able to put more than 20 models in production in three months. So there's a substantial increase in um, productivity and throughput by using the platform. Mm -hmm. um, but also we want to make it um, uh, available um, for developers really. So people who want to bring their um, uh, machine learning capabilities into mm -hmm. their product. Yeah. And uh, because of the fact that the configuration system they were based on is, uh, doesn't require them to write a low level machine learning code, mm -hmm. we can empower them to actually build the machine learning capabilities in their, in their uh, applications right. um, in a way that is substantially easier uh, and faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, well, we talk a, lot, a little bit about um, different type of ML ops tools. So uh, now people are storing their data in different type of cloud providers, and then they might use some other tools like Arise, Weights and Biases, MLflow, et cetera. So how does um, pretty base integrate with different type of tools, or are you trying to build everything within pretty base? Yeah, so I would say um, there's in particular for Ludwig, really, mm -hmm. there's many connectors to many different um, open source tools uh, and non open source tools. There's what's and biases comment, mm -hmm. um, MLflow, AIMstack, um, and then it makes it very easy to keep track of training all of the models on all these platforms. Yeah, um, from the pretty base perspective. Um, I would say Predibase, the, the, the value of Predibase is bringing all these capabilities together in one. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do it um, as opposed to like, there's companies that are building only one piece of all of that. Mm -hmm. And that's like a really valuable piece. Yeah, the example of, of what's and is good for like experiment tracking and yeah, evaluation of models. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to be able to be used by everybody, they need to be compatible with all yeah. the different systems, like all the different types of models, all the different modalities of interacting mm -hmm. with them. Um, for us, it's simpler. We need to make it work only with the models. And so we can build like a really good um, model evaluation and tracking and management system within Pridebase without the need to go outside of Pridebase. Mm -hmm. And so we are building all these components to be really uh, working together within the Pridebase platform, while at the same time, we're making it very modular and interoperable with other systems, in particular through the Python SDK, mm -hmm. meaning that you can get the data from wherever you want, in, as long as it's in a data frame format or in a database data warehouse format, or on a S3 bucket or object store, then you can like easily uh, pop into the system. And uh, on the converse, on the output side, you can write the data back into the data source that it's mm -hmm. coming from, or you can use you know, the models for your time prediction. So um, the uh, REST APIs or gRPC APIs that you have as the output can also be easily hooked into everything else, right? Yeah. Um, and now with the hype of large language models and generative AI, are there uh, capabilities in Ludwig and pretty base to support this uh, this need for developers? Yeah, so in Ludwig, there's, there's a new version of 8 that is coming out, which um, it's literally all about the generative. Mm -hmm. um, AI, in particular around large language models, mm -hmm. and the fact that we're introducing capabilities for um, using large language models, querying them, mm -hmm. doing um, zero-shot learning, few-shot learning, um, fine-tuning them, and potentially even training them from scratch. Mm -hmm. So all these capabilities will uh, be available in this you know, new version of Ludwig, which, again, if you go on the GitHub page, you can already start to use. It's just the release is not out yet. And in Predibase, we basically we want Predibase to be the platform for building uh, machine learning projects declaratively. Mm. And that's true for like predictive uh, machine learning and also mm. for generative machine learning. From our perspective, it doesn't make a huge difference in terms of the capabilities of the platform. We want to support any machine learning project, really, mm -hmm. right? Um, but at the same time, we're building you know, these capabilities into the platform, also by providing UIs that make it easy to iterate over prompts, uh, figuring out things that work particularly well, integrate the prompts with data for doing, again, uh, zero shot, few shot learning, and then uh, fine tune uh, your models 
on your data and your use cases um, by never leaving your virtual private cloud. So making it secure, fast, and cheap to do um, in a way that makes it so that um, you don't have to um, rely on external APIs to do it. You can be the owner of your own IP, the owner of your own network models um, forever, really. Yeah, yeah. because now with the uh, large language models and uh, you know, chat GPT co-pilot, I see a lot of demos of products using um, OpenAI's um, API or other um, open source large language models, but it's easy to build a demo, but it's hard to put things in um, production. So what are some challenges um, when you productionize large language models? Yeah, so for many of the companies that we've been uh, chatting with that are you know, uh, uh, considering using these new capabilities that we're introducing in the platform, mm -hmm. What they're telling us is that, <clears throat> um, again, all of the things that I mentioned are actually challenges for them. One is the security and the fact that in some cases they cannot have data uh, leave their, um, their, their, their clouds or yeah. their, their, their premises mm -hmm. um, for the nature of that data. Maybe it's like private information mm -hmm. or customer information or anything like that, right? So it cannot really leave. That's one aspect. The other aspect is even when it can leave the premises, mm -hmm. um, in whenever you get to a point where the amount of interactions, amount of API calls that you need to do uh, passes a certain threshold, it becomes too expensive. Yeah. And finally, if you have above a certain amount of um, of data that you're actually uh, working with, for instance, streaming cases, um, in those cases, really it becomes infeasible to um, wait for the model answers in terms of latency. Mm -hmm. So it's just um, the current LLM APIs are just too slow to yeah. be able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are all the, the, the three things, really, that we are trying to address all at once um, with the capabilities that we're introducing in the database. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are some uh, tips for people who want to fine tune their large language models? Yeah, I would say um, the tip is, first of all, try to figure out if you actually need to do it. Mm. Um, because um, in some cases, um, doing few shot learning and basically interacting with um, either previous data, both in form of potential like examples for the model or uh, in the form of like snippets of text or whatever else is um, you know, the structure of your data mm -hmm. and augmenting the prompts that you're already um, creating with this uh, additional information uh, can go a long way mm -hmm. and can improve the model performance substantially yeah. without the need to actually do the fine tuning. Mm -hmm. And then if that performance is not enough, then that's the time when you should probably consider starting doing fine tuning. But it is, um, and you know, we're trying to make it as inexpensive as possible, but mm -hmm. it's still a relatively expensive process as opposed to just trying out doing few shot learning, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say first try that. Yeah. Um, and in general, what are some besides, say, um, summarizing internal documents, um, make the search for, you know, text-based documents better, um, creating some chatbots for customer service? So what are some new use cases you observed um, for large language models. Yeah, so one thing I'm fascinated with by, and you know, I'm liking it a lot, um, there's also like more open source products and some companies working on that, is the, uh, if you want, using the large language models as an orchestration mechanism mm -hmm. for interacting with different modules that each of them are like specifically doing something um, uh, really, you know, um, tailored to a specific thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, an example of that is, you know, having calculations. So you can have like a function that does a calculation and have the language model learning how to interact with that function so that it doesn't have to do the calculation but mm -hmm. can just ask that module to do that calculation. Uh, or like another thing could be, you know, doing other tasks, for instance, with images that the language model may not know how to do, mm -hmm. but if there's, um, you know, interface or a function call that they can call to actually do these things, then they can become basically the dispatcher of um, that makes it possible to interact mm -hmm. with all these uh, sub-modules 
And that's really fascinating to me. Like there's a company called Fixie that does that. A a, called a what? A company called Fixie uh-huh. that does that. Okay. And there's a bunch of open source products mm-hmm. also that are, you know, uh, being created around that. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I think it's really, really valuable and very interesting. Yeah. Have you tried to play with it, automate some of your own tasks? I tried. I think these things are still in their infancy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I wasn't able to actually fully uh, mm-hmm. automate some of my tasks through that. Yeah. But I think, you know, with work, uh, mm-hmm. they will improve over time. Yeah. So now with a lot of hype, uh, everything you see on social media, people sharing those tips about chat GPT, and then there's every few days, there's some updates on large language models. Um, what's your advice for data scientists to learn while being focused? Because I feel a lot of anxiety is also generated. There's a lot of um, distractions out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's information overflow, mm-hmm. right? There's this too much information about it. There's yeah. too much um, content created around it, too many papers, yeah. too many everything, right? So um, I would say the way I approach it is twofold. On one hand, try to identify sources of information that you kind of trust and believe to be um, you know, sources that you can, you can you can rely on and that give you enough amount of information that makes you feel like you are um, in the loop of what's mm-hmm. happening without overwhelming you. And on the other hand, to just give up on the idea to be able to keep up with everything because yeah. it's just not possible. Right. And so just accept that you're going to have a limited amount, uh, uh, um, let's say, um, a limited amount of information, but um, to keep that information broad mm-hmm. so that then whenever you feel that there's something that you find particularly interesting, then you can go deep on that specific thing. Um, then I'm, when, when, when the need arises, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, I think it's okay to be a little bit delayed. Um, sometimes uh, a model or a, a product um, developed, say, a month ago, maybe it's not relevant anymore so sometimes just let things let time help you filter out some <laughs> projects uh, that, that's what i do because i'm lazy also lazy i don't want to always learn all the new tools uh, especially if you think about like lindy effect if something have been um, there for a long time it's probably gonna still be there for example i think something like sql people are still gonna use it um and uh, so you, you talk about large language model can also help people uh, orchestrate workflows. So for, for example, if I'm a, a data scientist, I work on ML task using just tabular data, um, but not text data. Hmm. Say the use case I work on is fraud detection based on bank transactions, or uh, I'm predicting sales using time series data. Will large language models impact my workflow or any ML tools I use? So, I mean, the, the answer is that for what we have right now, mm-hmm. um, and if you think about general large language models, the answer is probably no. Um, although I think that when people start to train their own, like fine tune large language models on specific tasks, that then the answer can be yes. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time, usually these tasks involve a lot of like super specific domain knowledge. Yeah. And because of that, something that is trained on, let's say, the internet as mm. its data source may not be the best, you know, source of truth and solutions for these specific um, tasks, right? Mm. Um, so um, I believe that you know we're going to see more of the technology behind the language models used for these tasks for sure, and the language models themselves to be fine-tuned and trained for helping with these tasks more holistically. Mm. I'm not super sure if for the specific f- transaction fraud that would be useful or not, probably mm-hmm. not. But um, overall, I think we're gonna see more of the, the, the very least the same technologies applied to that. Right, so large language models might um, uh, be useful in different domains of data science. It's just, uh, I guess, a matter of time of how we are going to um, going to use it and how we get kind of fine tune using the context of that specific domain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I also think that, you know, the specifics of the transaction itself, for mm-hmm. instance, 
that may not be the best task to be doing with large models in general. Yeah. Right? But maybe the large model can produce some, you know, um, additional information for the for 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 transaction that could mm -hmm. be useful for then evaluating them more fully. There's there's a lot of um, let's say potential uh, things that one could do. Right now, I don't see that being like the, the killer application, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, there is a lot of discussion around, oh, will large language models or AI-based tools replace data scientists? I think if you have worked on any data science project, you know uh, you still need to talk to stakeholders, align their interests, and work with engineers on deployment. Maybe some of the work will be simplified, but I think, uh, you know, I, I don't think data scientists will be automated, but uh, it's a possibility that data science team will become smaller. Um, so what do you think about um, how, how do data science today remain competitive in the, in the industry? I think, so I don't know if data science team will become smaller. I think that there could be like a, a actually a flywheel effect mm. where they could actually become larger. Yeah. And if you think about, again, programming, right? And to go back to that example before of mm -hmm. the compilers, um, if there were 10,000 assembly um, um, programmers before, yeah. when C or any, let's say, larger, like a higher level uh, language was introduced and opened up the possibility for more people to do it, um, mm -hmm. maybe there were less jobs for assembly programmers now mm -hmm. than there were like in the 70s but there are more jobs for programmers overall now than there were in the right. 70s. So, you know, these tools can be, again, an enabling factor mm. for actually doing more data science, doing more machine learning, which means more jobs. Yeah. Maybe that doesn't mean that, it, that you know, what data scientists are doing today is exactly what they will be doing mm -hmm. tomorrow. Yeah. But in general, the skill sets will translate really well. Mm. So what do you think about some new job families? Um, it's very hard to predict it, but mm -hmm. I can imagine that it could be like a little bit more of a fragmentation. So maybe there's um, people who, whose job will be nursing models and looking at their performance and making mm -hmm. sure and, you know, working with data to modify and improve the data aspects to make the models work better, as opposed to people that now maybe are working more on models, for instance, right? That's one option. Or maybe the people that are working on models, they will be like, you know, like compilers, engineers today. Mm. They will be the ones working on the compilers level of the, like uh, the lower level, right? Right. Instead of having everybody working at the same level, maybe there's multiple levels mm. and people working at all the different levels with different requirements and, and job descriptions, right? That is something that could happen. Definitely. Yeah. And what do you think about, uh, in terms of skill set, what are more important today compared to, say, a data scientist five years ago? So I would say one thing that in my mind is always, always going to be important is the basics. Mm. If you study the basics and you're strong with the basics, then you can, you know, move from one level to another and from one job within a domain to another very, very easily. Yeah. And so what it's not gonna be there 10 years from now, 20 years from now is, mm -hmm. I don't know, like specific knowledge of a specific library. Mm -hmm. Like if we can use really well PyTorch today, maybe 10 years from now there's something else. So that's not gonna be as relevant as, as it is today, right? Yeah. But if you know how, um, how like, um, how stochastic gradient descent works mm -hmm. and in general how optimization works, that's very likely still going to be there in a form of another 10 years from now, right? right? So the deeper you go, the more to the basics you go, the more reusable that, that knowledge that you gain is across the board. Yeah, um, I agree with that. Um, and then uh, during your PhD, you researched question answering on NLP and semantics. So you finished your PhD in 2015 before the transformer paper was released. So what was the uh, NLP research interest back then versus today? What are the, some biggest changes? Yeah, I think over time, um, NLP research has moved a lot from more, um, I'd say more 
again, I don't want to overgeneralize, but you know, for a more linguistics oriented and logic based um, systems, mm -hmm. gradually more and more towards machine learning. At that moment, it was the very beginning um, of people starting to apply deep learning uh, to NLP. Up until then, mostly of what people were doing was applying statistical uh, models and machine learning models mm -hmm. to, to language, right? Yeah. For instance, now we're calling those things large language models, but you know, language models in terms of just n-gram probabilities were there since, I, in like, probably at, least, at the very least the 90s, probably even earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the, uh, the difference was like a gradual transition towards new kind of um, approaches towards machine learning. And now there's an even like different um, step function really because um, now there are basically NLP, well, papers at NLP conferences mm -hmm. that you could argue they're not even machine learning anymore. They're you know using the um, large language models as a computational device. Yeah, they're not even you know changing anything of the large language models. They're using the inputs and outputs and analyzing those inputs and outputs of the large language model as the goal of what they're doing, analyzing the text, for instance, in a specific case of of, of that. Mm -hmm. And then it's like a new a new an entirely new development, which is interesting to see, and it's like kind of a, odds. Um, I can imagine that probably in the near future there could be also a split there, right? There could be like conferences that are more about the um, machine learning aspects of NLP and conferences mm -hmm. that are more about the um, interaction with large language models aspects of NLP, right? Right, yeah. Um, and then what about tools? For example, what was your tech stack while you were working at Uber versus today? Yeah, so say even before Uber, the tech stack was um, when I actually started working, even 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 before Uber, mm -hmm. was mostly a Java stack, and we were using like more statistical uh, modeling techniques, uh, like topic modeling, and I was using um, you know more distributional semantics um, techniques that didn't have like you could argue that you know. Um, word to back was one of the most popular um, techniques in that field, but there were like 70 years of research before that and many techniques and many tools that people were using. But again, at that moment in time, Java was mostly the, 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 the Java stack was mm. mostly the, the, the one that people were using. And um, for instance, I was writing, I did an internship at Yahoo and I was writing um, MapReduce jobs mm. in Java from scratch, which I don't think there's anyone who is doing it today, probably, yeah. or very, very few people that are doing it today, right? And then um, over time, it switched more to the uh, Python stack. I think at the moment, in 2015, like when I when I joined um, IBM, that was probably the um, moment when I started to do the switch more to like a, a Python stack, mm -hmm. and because in Python you had um, more. Um, Machine learning oriented yeah. uh, technologies and mm -hmm. you know scikit learn was available and we started using it for some tasks and and then gradually moving towards the more deep learning um, frameworks, starting using um, TensorFlow and Teano, and then and then when PyTorch was released, full switch on top of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, what are what are some of your um, beliefs that about could be about machine learning or more specifically large language model that you feel mo some people might disagree with you? Mm. Well, I would say more than disagree with, I think there are things that are unpopular mm -hmm. or people may not know about that I find particularly interesting. Okay. And I think if researched with the same amount of attention that you know other research um, is 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 getting now or has been getting in the near in, in, the, in the last few years I think could bring advances similar um, to what we've been seeing from from more deep learning techniques for instance um, but you know there's not the same amount of research going on behind the scenes right mm. um, and some examples of that is anything that is non-gradient based learning mm. um, 
I think um, research in um, like self self organizing um, kind of systems or like um, genetic algorithms and evolutionary evolutionary approaches uh, is super super interesting and I think has a lot to um, to bring to the table even if it has not been explored as much I mean there are conferences specifically on that mm -hmm. but it's not in the uh, foreground of the research community right mm -hmm. now right and so um, I think there's, there's a lot of untapped potential there yeah and then in terms of industries do you feel um, there's going to be industry for example I don't know healthcare or finance that will be the next industry to be um, revolutionized by AI? Um, if I have to think immediately about the next one mm -hmm. or the one that is already being um, revolutionized is probably um, content creation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think and both, you know, from like a purely textual perspective, but also from like a um, like visual video audio yeah like it's already happening really and mm -hmm. the same answer three months ago may have felt differently and now there's already there's already a lot going on right and it may be for good or for bad right there are some aspects of uh, content creation mm -hmm. that um maybe they are not the right things to automate and other things that you know people will gladly want to automate i think we will find a balance eventually mm -hmm. where um, the technology that we're developing will be used as tools by the right people that know how to use them and know how to you know, do content creation to begin with, right? That's in my mind the state that we will converge to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also nowadays there are a lot of different type of uh, assistant. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about co-pilot, uh, I know in Predibase there is also a, a function copilot for for data scientists, and there is going to be maybe other type of co uh, copilot um, for say on um, Facebook, social media, or or different type of tools we use. Um, and uh, so, what do you think about us? with all those AI assistants, do you feel that will make us more efficient or do you think there is a potential that we'll lose our own like independent critical thinking? So what is the best way you think to use um, co-pilots? So I don't think we're gonna lose the independent thinking, it's just a matter of how much we're gonna uh, train it and exercise it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, the problem is is that if who runs the show? That's that's the important thing, right? If if the show is a large machine, and humans become cogs in that machine, mm -hmm. is not great. If humans run the show and use the cogs and the machines that are like the yeah. assistants, then that's the, the right way to to see. It. Mm -hmm. But that it's a more like um, uh, what you want a societal perspective of what is important, right? Uh, is like the well-being of human beings the first um, the first order of business? And if that is the case, then I think we're going to do well. If we make something else the first order of business, um, if we make just efficiency the first order of business, then I don't think that that, that, that could be, that could lead to like a situation where it's not ideal mm. for, for, for humans, right? But again, we make the decision as a society, right? Yeah. So, um, so how do we make sure humans are running the show? It's a difficult question. And I would say, in general, we need to make sure that people understand things for real. Mm -hmm. Like in this case, these technologies, they need to understand for real what they do, yeah. why they do it, mm -hmm. and um, how to use them correctly, incorrectly, and what are the boundaries really? Because yeah. they may not be like a really correct way or not, mm -hmm. just what it is. If I really understand what it is, mm -hmm. then I can make my own decisions on how to use it, right? Yeah. If you have that understanding, then at the very least, you can make a decision on um, how much impact do you want mm -hmm. technology to have on you. If you do not understand how it works, it's much more difficult to have that determination. Mm -hmm. So I would say 
I wouldn't say that's it's the silver bullet, but it's uh, first step for sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, so now you are a CEO of a company. Um, so when you look back at your career, um, what are some, from a CEO's perspective or as a, as a manager, what are some um, advice you give your younger self as a you know, individual contributor? Mm, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so I mean, now I have a little bit more of a different perspective, obviously, mm -hmm. and it's more of a bigger picture perspective. While before, I may have been really, you know, super focused on the relatively narrow thing that I was working at each moment in time. Mm -hmm. And so, maybe the advice that I would give myself is to try to keep constantly a narrow point of view, mm -hmm. even while working on something very specific because that makes it possible for you to kind of anticipate next moves a little bit better and understand more broadly the implications of what you're doing. Right? Mm. So even if you're working on something specific, try to broaden your yeah, scope absolutely. a little bit. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, what are some mistakes you made in your career? I would say maybe um, not to do to say the same thing again, but mm -hmm. maybe during my career, I've been at uh, moments very focused on, on something. Um, <clears throat> maybe not paying as much attention mm -hmm. to what was happening around me. And so I may have been, <clears throat> maybe just to make a concrete example, yeah. adopting some technologies a little bit later than I would have wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, that in retrospect, I could have done if I was more receptive and more listening and understanding to what was going on, yeah. I could have been like a little bit more ahead of the curve in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, honestly, one needs to think that um, there are some cases where investing time on learning new things and new technologies mm -hmm. before they are solidified, that may be also a little bit detrimental sometimes. Yeah. So, so as you mentioned, you know, Learning something that you know in a month from now is not going to be relevant anymore it may not be the most the best use of your time. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, certainly, you know, being more open to listen to what is happening mm -hmm. uh, and a little bit listening to my own conviction mm -hmm. that, that would have been like positive for sure. Yeah. And uh, so in general, say there is a new technology and if you have decided you want to learn it, how do you um, learn? Um, I would say like, from a really practical perspective, mm -hmm. usually I start with a very small um, bit of information. So like if it's a paper, I read the abstract. Or if it's like a new library, uh, if there's a video on YouTube, maybe I watch a video okay. on YouTube about it. And the shorter the better mm. to get like a really high level understanding. Mm. And that makes it possible for me to determine if I believe that there's enough value for me to dive deeper. Yeah. And then I increase the um, uh, scope gradually. Mm. And, and then I get to the point where I have tried to have dedicated time for study and whatever study means, like could be reading the full paper and the corollary papers, or may mean uh, reading for the documentation of a project. Mm -hmm. um, and then usually the final step is to have like a micro project or anything like concrete to apply what I just learned, right. like to like implement that paper or look at the code of that mm -hmm. paper and use it for doing something else that is not what is written in the paper. Yeah or if it's like a new library, to use it in a concrete project. And maybe even just a toy is sufficient to, mm -hmm. get, to get started. Yeah. And then um, if needed, then cycle back. Like mm -hmm. saying, now that I have used it, what did I learn? Is, is there something else that I, you know, maybe reading the paper or re-looking at the documentation after having used it right. opens up a little bit more. So it's an iterative process of like broadening and broadening mm -hmm. over time up to the point where of diminishing return. Yeah, so you learn the high level and then try to learn through doing. And when you have some questions, you can always come back to the kind of finer yeah. grains of details. That is a bit different from what other people, I, I see other people doing. So there's other people that I see like really start from doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually start from what is for me is understanding mm -hmm. and then I do. Yeah. 
and then I go back to understand and then iterate, uh, alternate. Iterate, yeah. Dance, right? mm. um, there's people who are like, prefer only the theoretical understanding and only look at the mm. papers. People who only look at the uh, code or just look at the like tinkering of things is the way that they learn about them. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a mix of both and alternating between them is the best way for me. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to learn. Um, and what is a important feedback that has changed your career? So I don't think there was like one specific feedback really, but more, I would say, observations mm. um, from like former managers, or former, yeah. like people that I've seen doing great things. Mm -hmm. but I would say um, maybe one observation of how one specific person that I worked with in the past, and I'm you know, super you know, um, happy to have worked with and, and, and super humbled by having worked with them, was Peter Diane. Mm. Um, basically, one thing that he was always doing when we were working, uh, when he was like, doing a sabbatical with us at Uber AI, is that at the end of every presentation that he was attending, he would um, ask questions, and those questions usually were incredibly fitting, meaning that most of the people who received those questions started to think back at the things that they presented and the work that they've done, mm -hmm. and realized that really they should have asked those questions to themselves at the beginning. Right. Yeah, so they, they made them rethink mm -hmm. from scratch what they were doing. Really yeah. well. And so what I gathered from that is to be on the outlook for, like when you work on something and you go straight into a path, you need a moment, in this case, someone, mm -hmm. but maybe the someone could be yourself to ask again the questions at the beginning that make you reevaluate what you've done so far and maybe that leads to a better path, right? Right, like why we're doing what we're doing. Sometimes we get into the technical detail or forgot the uh, initial motivation. Um, yeah, to have alignment with ourselves. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, so now as a CEO, when you hire a engineer or data scientist, what are some important qualities that you look for? So on one hand, there are some technical aspects, obviously. You know, mm. they, need to be able to, um, for us specifically, to you know do the job. Yeah. Really. And so what we usually try to do is to make interviews that kind of look like what people would do um, if they were to join us. Right. Um, and that's the best way to, it's like the more direct kind of feedback mm -hmm. you can get, right? Um, on the other hand, um, I try also to probe for like, more fundamental understanding and fundamental mm -hmm. uh, knowledge because that for me is a proxy of how malleable and yeah. how adaptable uh, this person will be over time and how mm -hmm. capable of like doing different things and jumping on new projects etc mm -hmm. um, how they will be capable of doing that over time and and then there's like an aspect of uh, can i personally work together with this person fruitfully like from a, a human point of view right yeah because um me and the general, in general, the company, right? Because I've been, um, we've been building um, company culture around what you know, the founders at the beginning felt was was the uh, people that they were um, happy to work with, mm -hmm. and honestly, that that, it, that it, for a startup, that there is like you cannot do without that, right? You need to work because you're working shoulder to shoulder, and you need to be um, really at the very least compatible with these people and work mm -hmm. together. So this is like not something specific for the other scientists, but for literally for everybody really that we hire. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so um, why you name Ludwig? Ludwig. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it's a secret, and usually I try not to disclose it. <laughs> okay. No, it's it's uh, it's named after Ludwig Wittgenstein, a philosopher from the first half of the twentieth century, mm -hmm. and. Uh, there's a video that I put up on, on, on YouTube where people can search for it. I mean, nobody has watched it, but um, that basically tries to connect the ideas in um, 
structuralism mm -hmm. and the general ideas on the philosophy of language. And it was one of the things that he was working on towards the uh, second half of his career, if mm -hmm. you want, um, all the way down to the development in um, NLP, in linguistics, and the connection with actually the um, machine learning that I see today. Mm. So in my mind, this all, all these things connect. Um, also published a paper with a friend of mine, uh, Jacopo Tagliavue, on um, in a, like, um, uh, a philosophy journal about mm. it. And uh, people can search, search for it. I think it's fun. Cool. Yeah, we can link it to the show notes. So how has philosophy or what specific ideas from philosophy has, you know, impacted you? Uh, I would say there's many different ways and many different aspects. Um, one thing that I'm finding more and more um, uh, valuable is um, looking back at moral philosophy and that finds, um, that helps me find, you know, um, some grounding in moments like the one where we're living these days mm -hmm. of um, uh, where a lot of change happened. All yeah. Times, right. And in particular, like I, I like to read the Stoics, and in particular Marcus Aurelius. Mm. Um, that is something that you know keeps me grounded and gives me um, a lot of um, you know um, calm. Yeah. In how to then approach uh, change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So. Um, before we wrap up, what are you excited about? Um, could be your personal life, it could be your career this year. Oh, well, I mean, with the, you know, release uh, of the journal availability of mm -hmm. anyways, that's definitely the most exciting thing uh, in my, in my uh, happening in my, in my you know, uh, work life, for sure, right? Mm -hmm. um, other than that, there are some developments that I'm seeing around that I'm, you know, excited about. And in particular, um, I think um, there's this interface between um, uh, machine learning and AI in general and video games that is developing in a way that is interesting. Mm. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what people can build with like autonomous agents in like um, uh, worlds um, and like NPCs in, in video games mm. and how people are making them will be making them substantially more um, autonomous, substantially more um, interactive and uh, I wouldn't say human-like, but at the very least much more um, uh, make it possible to have a dialogue with those characters. And, yeah. uh, I see that the, the fringe of AI and video games to be like a really exciting place and mm -hmm. I'm looking, uh, excited to see what, what people will come up with. Yeah, and you got into machine learning because you're interested in video games. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and for me, like, it's kind of this the current um, convergence of these kind of technologies kind of mm -hmm. closes the loop, right? Yeah, yeah. And do you feel in the future uh, you will have a side project or build something? Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think there will be a lot of fun and I will have a lot of fun doing it. Um, I think that building the infrastructure to actually enable that, that mm -hmm. will be, you know, I think in pretty much could be a good infrastructure for enabling that, for instance, so. Yeah, that would be really cool. There is a funny story of how me and uh, Piero met. We actually met through another guest that has been on the podcast, Kyle Crean, and actually we talked about Grab Neural Network on the episode. Yeah. And then I met Piero around that time. I was still working at Amazon, but I was looking for some opportunity in, in startups and now I worked at Pettybase um, creating um, some educational content working with um, some uh, Ludwig open source so I'm also very excited uh, now our product has launched and more people can uh, use it so if um, uh, our listeners want to um, get in touch with you learn more about um, your your journey or want to learn more about uh, Ludwig or Predibase, where can they um, find Yeah, them? so there's plenty of things available on the web about it. Um, there's, you know, Ludwig Open Source, Ludwig.ai website. There's, you know, Predibase.com, where we have a lot of blog posts, some of which mm -hmm. you're helping write. <laughs> um, 
the um, there's my personal website um, where you know I list a bunch of things that I've worked on, projects, papers that I published, mm. and all of that. So there's a lot of stuff there if you're interested. Um, and you know, feel free to reach out to me on social media on like. Um, Twitter, LinkedIn are the ones that I use the most. So I'm a little bit of a lurker more than an active <laughs> poster, but you know, um, yeah, those are, those are the places where people can reach out to me. Great. Um, yeah, thanks again for coming to the show and I uh, really enjoyed the uh, conversation. Likewise, thank you so much, Lilian.